Welcome back, everyone, to another episode in this series looking at the First Crusade using the fantastic work done by Extra History. Uh, if you have not seen the first three episodes of my reaction to this series, there's a link in the description that will take you back to episode one, as is the link to the original content so you can see it without my commentary. No additional intro needed beyond that thank you as always to our patrons you make this channel possible especially when it comes to the original content and i've got a big announcement coming about original content still working out the details should be coming in the next couple of days i'm looking forward to sharing that with you let's go ahead and dive in to part four So, at last, the crusade sailed across the Bosphorus. All five of the crusading armies and the remnants of the Peasants' Crusade joining into one massive force to retake the Holy Land. The crusaders finally passed out of Christian territory. They weren't on allied ground anymore. For once, any damage they did would actually be to the enemy they were summoned to fight. The First Crusade really had begun. But as the ships crossed the Bosphorus and disgorged their cargo of men in mail and plate, of giant destriers barded for war, of crossbowmen counting their quarrels, they were met with a silent, empty plain. One after another, the Crusader forces arrived, and they waited. Anatolia was quiet. Too quiet. No Turkish horde came to sweep them back into the Bosphorus. No Saracen riders came to pour waves of arrows down on their crusading band. And so the princes met, discussed, and decided that they would move their forces to Nicaea, a few days' march away, with Godfrey de Bouillon at the head of the band. Now I should mention, as we're thinking about this, that it's always important for us when we are studying history that we can't judge that history on our modern concepts of the way things are or what is acceptable, what is considered appropriate. So, for example, by modern terms, we live in a time of smart bombs and precision attacks where any loss of civilian life or damage to civilian property is seen as this terrible thing. And a lot of times we like to throw around the word war crimes. When we start applying that even to acts that happened 100 or 200 years ago, we start to get into a very different time in world history. And you go back a thousand years and there's really no major separation between fighting on the battlefield and what is done by an army to the countryside, to the towns, to the people. It's all part of war. Now, yeah, you can still say, well, yeah, but sometimes they were more vicious than others when it comes to those things, yes. But pillaging and plundering was honestly just an accepted part of war at that time. If your army went into enemy territory, it was expected you were going to loot and pillage and burn and destroy not just the army, but the civilian populace as well. By our modern standards, that's horrific to think of, but it wasn't that way at the time. Nicaea was an important city. It was strategically important. It held the road to Jerusalem. If they couldn't take it, they'd have to march a much more difficult path with an incredible enemy stronghold at their back. Nicaea was also symbolically important. The first ecumenical council, the Council of Nicaea, Nicaean had Creed. once been called there by the Emperor Constantine himself to determine what was orthodox for the Christian world. And it was politically important. When Kilij Arslan took over the Sultanate of Rum, he took Nicaea for his capital. It housed the royal treasury and the family of the Sultan. So the crusading forces marched on Nicaea. Godfrey and Boimond and Tancred arrived first, followed by Raymond and Robert of Flanders. One by one, they set up the siege. And still, nothing happened. Still no Turks. This was getting weird. So, in the eerie... In hindsight, it's easy to, to look at this and say, you know what, there's a reason. You know, this isn't happening by accident. You shouldn't just be like, Meh. oh well, no big deal. Hopefully they're preparing for there being a reason why they're not seeing the Turks and they're thinking outside the box a little bit instead of just getting narrowly focused on what's in front of them. Quiet, the Crusader army broke into its component parts again and each army took a section of the high, ancient Roman walls to lay siege to. Godfrey took the north, Boimond and Tancred set up around the east. Raymond was still dawdling towards Nicaea, but the other two figured he could hold the southern wall when he got there. As for the west, well, one of the key features of Nicaea is that it sits on the Lake Ascania. And this is no small lake, it's about 115 square miles. 
the western wall of Nicaea abuts the lake itself, so the Crusaders figured, well, we don't really need to guard that. And thus, the Crusaders set up around the walls of Nicaea and promptly began to starve. But Bohemond, a seasoned military man, set up a system of naval resupply with the Byzantines. With that handled, the real work... That's huge. We talk about this all the time. An army marches on its stomach. You can only go as far as your supplies will take you. Logistics is everything. It doesn't matter how good you are on the battlefield if you're not feeding and supplying, supplying your troops. And the deeper you go into enemy territory, the more difficult that becomes to do. ...work of sitting around could get started. Just as Raymond finally dawdled into place, the Turks at last arrived. Kilich Arslan at the head of about 10,000 horse archers thundered down in the plain surrounding the city. This is like, and the winged hussars arrived, only it's the opposite happening. Now it's happening to the Christians instead of to the Muslims. Then he saw just how many crusaders he was facing, and turned right around and thundered off in the other direction. The crusaders gave chase with their heavy steeds, but as the Turkish horses were faster, the crusaders inflicted only light casualties on Kilij Arslan's force. I'm, I'm sorry, I just can't help but think, okay, the, the army arrives, we're gonna, ah, uh, nope, we're out of here. Still, they had routed them. The crusaders celebrated. They held the field, and morale was lifted. It was time to get back to the siege. Now, each of the crusading forces had a different idea on how the siege should go. Some were trying to wait it out. Others were building siege engines. Others were digging under the walls, but none of this seemed to have much effect. You know, and all of this stuff is typical siege warfare, but again, this is the problem when you're dealing with a coalition force, all of whom have different ideas on how things should be done, regardless of who might actually be in charge. This is what made... World War II, for example, so brilliant is that all of the main allied forces, at least on the Western Front, uh, agreed on a plan in which you would have one supreme allied commander, Dwight Eisenhower. That was so important to being able to effectively uh, carry out a strategy. Finally, it dawned on them that the Western Wall on the lake was a little more important than maybe they had first thought. Turns out the garrison at Nicaea was secretly getting resupplied by boats coming over the lake at night. That kind of threw a wrench in this whole siege plan. The Crusaders didn't have enough forces to guard the entire coast of that enormous lake, and they didn't have a navy of their own to stop the resupply either. But if they didn't somehow prevent supplies from getting into the city, the defenders could practically hold out forever. Yep. So what do they do? Well, in a feat of logistics that could only be achieved by the heirs of Rome, the Byzantines came to the rescue. They sailed a group of ships to the harbor at Kivito, hauled them out of the water, put them on rollers, and dragged them to Nicaea. The next day, with as much fanfare as possible, the Byzantine ships began an assault from the lake, while the Crusaders assaulted the walls of the city from the shore. And soon, with their resupply cut off and their reinforcements nice. driven back, the people of Nicaea offered to surrender. But here's where it gets complicated, because who do you surrender to? There were basically five crusading armies and the Byzantines surrounding the city. To make it even more complicated, the garrison in the city, the only guys with weapons, were all Muslim Turks, while the population of the city, who vastly outnumbered them, were Orthodox Christians who used to be part of the Eastern Roman Empire. Oh, and not to mention the fact that the Sultan's wife and family were still in the city, as was the Sultan's treasury. So the negotiations began. But as the... And why does all that matter? Well, because, you know, if, if it weren't for those things, it's simple to say, okay, who cares? Just pick somebody, designate them as the one to receive the surrender. But... If you're the one that receives the surrender, are you recognized as being in charge? And if you're in charge, do you get more of the gold than everybody else does? Do you get to decide what happens to the people afterwards? There's a lot of logistics here. There's a lot of egos involved. Crusaders were negotiating. They were also periodically assaulting the city. During one of those assaults, somehow, magically, the 2,000 Byzantine troops scaled the walls and captured the city, a feat which tens of thousands of Crusaders hadn't been able to achieve. That might seem like an incredible military feat, but remember, this is Emperor Alexius Komnenos we're talking about, and he was always a crafty guy. He knew that if the Crusaders got a hold of Nicaea, they would loot it until it burned to the mm. ground, and then maybe not even give it back to him afterwards. And remember, his goal in all of this is not necessarily let's regain the Holy Land for Christendom, it's let's get my territory back, let's rebuild my empire. So he wants it as intact as possible. That would not do. So, he had secretly made a deal with basically everybody inside the city to just let him take it. 
he let the Turks go free, he ensured the safety of the Sultan's family, he brought the people of Nicaea back into the Imperial fold, and promised them protection from ransacking. And in return, they just sort of let his troops over the walls. Once the city was firmly in his hands, he let the Crusaders in. But now I'm thinking, and we'll see if I'm right about this, if I'm these crusading armies who are doing a lot of the work to make this happen, I'm thinking, well, again, what's in it for me? Uh, w not so much the rank and file soldier who, again, we figure are fighting for salvation. Um, the, the men who want money, who want loot, who want something to uh, justify the, the expense of making all this happen. What's in it for them if the Byzantine emperor is just going to take everything? In small groups and always under guard. But he tried to placate the Crusaders with gifts, to varying degrees of effect. He also tried to get go. them to reaffirm their oath to him to return Byzantine territory, also with varying degrees of effect. And so the Byzantines remained garrisoned in Nicaea, and the Crusaders prepared to press on. But hang on, what exactly was going on with the Turks this whole time? Why hadn't they showed up until it was too late? Where was Kilij Arslan the whole time the Crusade was marching on Nicaea? Well, have I got a surprise twist for you. I bet you thought this whole time that that whole Peasants' Crusade thing was useless, perhaps even more than useless. Well, ha! Turns out, by dying so pathetically in such large numbers so quickly, they had convinced Kilij Arslan that the Crusading forces were not worth worrying about. And so, by heroically being such utter and unmitigated failures, the Peasants' Crusade had lulled the Sultan into thinking he had far more pressing things to deal with than these silly French people who kept showing up on his shores. Like medieval Europe, the Islamic states were also always involved in minor wars against one another, and the Sunni-Shia split led some in Europe to believe that the Muslim sects were more likely to ally with the Crusaders against one another than actually band together to fight. So, yeah, this is important here because this is something you hear a lot about even today, Sunni and Shia, and again, by no means any kind of an expert on Islam, but basically it comes down to a debate over who was the rightful successor of the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, in leading Islam afterwards. And one group wanted it to uh, be chosen by the Islamic community. The others uh, wanted it to basically be an inheritance from Muhammad himself. And so that's something we see to this day, the divide between Sunni and Shia in uh, the Islamic world. Um, it plays itself out in places like Iran, Iraq, and others sects were more likely to ally with the Crusaders against one another than actually band together to fight. And when the Crusaders had landed, Kilij Arslan had been off in the eastern part of his realm dealing with border disputes from one of the other Islamic states. He had actually been informed of the Crusaders landing almost immediately, but he figured they'd probably bumble themselves to death before he'd even get there, and that his garrisons could deal with whatever trouble they might create anyway. In one of the great ironies of history, if the Peasants' Crusade hadn't expired in mass without doing any real damage, the Prince's Crusade might have been swept hmm. back into the sea before it ever had a chance to group up and gather steam. But gather it had, and now the Crusade began to head south. But finding supply too difficult to manage, they split again into two forces. A smaller force led by Bohemond and Tancred in the vanguard, and a larger force with Godfrey, Raymond, Stephen, and Hugh behind. So, on the surface... Don't divide your army, especially if there's a superior force and you're in enemy territory. But it is right that when you divide your army, you can move faster, you can forge for supplies better. It makes sense until one part of your army gets attacked, which I'm guessing is probably what's going to happen here. After about four days' march, as dawn broke and Bohemond's forces began to wake in a small valley outside Derylium, Turks started to pour out of the surrounding hills. Kilij Arslan was not done yet. The Turks whirled in and out of the camp, slaughtering civilians and unarmored combatants. Individual knights tried to arm and mount amidst the chaos. Those who could tried heroically but futilely, often alone or in small gathered groups, to charge the fluid Turkish line. At last, Bohemond, riding furiously up and down the camp, shouted to his knights to dismount, lock shields, and defend the civilians. They formed a circle and tried to bring those without protection inside. The Turks rained arrows mm. down on the knights in an unending stream, and yet they stood, stolid and unmoving. In one of the most impressive acts of discipline in all of the Crusades, the knights held their line, for hours, never being baited into charging, never breaking formation as men fell from the deadly hail. That does take a tremendous amount of discipline to withstand that without feeling like, we've got to do something, we've got to act, we've got to change. That's gutsy. 
Inside the circle, people screamed as stray arrows made it over the wall of armor and shields and occasionally found their mark. Then the priests inside the circle began to sing, and those nearby began to sing with them. And the sun rose, and the men still held. Battered by such mortal rain, baking in the heat of Anatolia, wearing full mail armor under the blistering sun. Then the women began to bring water to the line of knights, risky though it was to try. And still the knights did one of the most difficult things for any army in any time. Simply take fire for hours without moving, without breaking, without ever being able to attack back at their foe. And the line held. Slowly throughout the day, small forces of crusaders arrived. Godfrey, with some fifty knights, abandoned his main force and cut his way to the embattled Bohemond, as did men of Hugh's forces. Then, at last, after seven straight hours of sun and arrows, Raymond's force arrived and slammed into the Turkish flank, surprising them completely. As he did so, Bohemond and Godfrey ordered the men to remount, abandon the shield wall, and charge the Turkish line. Feels a little like the Battle of the Bastards from Game of Thrones, doesn't it? Completely surrounded, withstanding. You know, I mean, it's a little more dire than that in Game of Thrones where they're being surrounded and slowly crushed, but then the army of the Vale arrives, you know. It's one of those moments where they hold out long enough for help to come. With a mighty cry of, Today, if God's willing, we'll all be rich. I'm completely serious. That was the battle cry. Just a bit more loud. Worst really? battle really? cry ever. That is a... Oh, man. There have been so much... So many better ones than that. Rich. I'm completely serious. That was the battle cry. Just a bit more Latin. Reeling, Kilij Arslan pulled back to a hilltop to defend. The fighting was fierce until at last, a force led by Bishop Ademar of all people, snuck around behind the Turks, burned their camp, and charged them from the rear. The Turkish line fell apart, and the way to Antioch was left open to the exhausted crusaders. Join us mm. next time for the march to Antioch, the trials of the desert, and a liberal interpretation of the meaning of oaths. And a liberal interpretation of the meaning of oaths. Oh boy. Interesting. This is a fascinating story. Like I said, one I don't know a lot about, so I've really been enjoying learning about this. I hope you have been too. If there's something specific you learned about today that you didn't know before, let me know in the comment section below or add to the conversation something that wasn't mentioned that gives a little bit more depth to this conversation and this topic. And we'll see you again tomorrow with part five. Thanks for watching.